wonder if you would to open your Bibles to the New Testament, the book of Acts and chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, please. Here at Danville, we've been engaged in a series of studies on the topic of evangelism, sharing the blessing of the gospel with our neighbors around us. And we began uh, with looking at the example of Jesus, and now we've moved on to give some very pointed lessons on various aspects or attitudes that we might encounter uh, with people that we know at the workplace or at school or in our neighborhoods. Last week, we talked about um, a more effective way to reach the gay community. And this week, we want to talk about reaching those of our friends and neighbors who might be skeptical about the Bible and about the gospel. Uh, and we are spreading this, this good news in an age of, of skepticism. That is kind of the millennial generation's greatest strength and its greatest weakness, I think, is that we're very skeptical. We like to question things. And I just want to point out before we begin that that's not bad. We can actually use that to our advantage. It's actually... Uh, it can be a good thing to be skeptical and to, to have some doubt if we work through those. Doubt and, and skepticism is what keeps us from being gullible. It's what keeps us from being too trusting or believing in something or acting on something that might not be true. And that's the thing inside all of us that causes us to test something before we put our trust in it and before we put our stamp of approval or endorsement on it. That's a biblical concept, right? Doesn't the Apostle John tell us to test the spirits? Don't believe every spirit. Lots of false prophets have gone out into the world, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, 1 John 4 in verse 1. And so all doubting is not wrong. It's how we deal with that doubt. It's if we deal with that doubt in an honest way, if we want to discover the truth. Doubt, if dealt with in the right way, can be sort of a vehicle to faith. It can be a bridge to, to have a conviction about something. Now, dealing with those doubts, it's, it's actually necessary for all people to come to faith in Jesus. It's a difficult part. It's a, it's a, it's a painful thing to go through. Uh, but we don't grow in our faith in Jesus. We don't, we don't get faith in God just by believing harder, you know, by, by just trying to do that in our minds. We grow in our faith by examining evidence, by exploring the details and the facts and using reason and logic to formulate a conviction and a conclusion. But here's the thing today. The, there's, there's a popular belief that the cultural narrative is that if I'm an atheist, and I, I come to the conviction, and I've worked it all out, I've come to the conviction that there is no God, then the popular belief is I got there by using logic and reason. But if I'm a Christian, and I've come to the conviction that there is a God, and He is alive, as, as we just sung, then I, I got there just by blind faith. And so there's this huge disparity between the two. And, and you see that when people, when you ask people, what is faith? And people say, well, you know, faith is belief in something you know can't be true. Or, or, or maybe faith is belief in the occurrence of the improbable. But the illogical belief in the occurrence of, of the improbable. There's no, there's no logic, there's no reason behind it at all. And so the narrative is, hey, if you want to become a mathematician, if you want to become a, a physicist, if you want to become a doctor, if you want to become a lawyer, that's when you use your brain. But if you want to become a Christian, that requires that you turn your brain off. And I'll tell you what, I can sympathize with people who believe that because I used to believe that. And I'll tell you why I believed it. Because the kind of preaching I was exposed to, before I met Bob Dickey that is, the kind of preaching that I was exposed to was so anti-intellectual, so patently emotional that it lacked any substance at all. And to believe in it, you would have to not think. You would have to switch off your brain. And so we have to combat that. Right? If we listen to that kind of, of, of preaching and we tolerate that kind of thing, and maybe that's how we preach to other people, this shallow, syrupy, vague, nonsense gospel, all it does is contribute to the idea that Christians are a bunch of idiots. And at the same time, it dismantles our ability to use reason and logic. Reason and logic. Brethren, if we care to read the Bible, 
what we see is that it, it tells us it's a great mistake to think that somehow, you know, faith and reason are incompatible. No, sir. They are two sides of the same coin. They go hand in hand. The way that the Bible is written, the way that our Master and our Lord taught people, He put the ball in our court. He said, you think about this. Let me lead you and let me show you the details. He used logic and reason. He challenged people to think and to come to the conviction on their own. Uh, I love G.K. Chesterton. He once said this, The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. He says, it has been found difficult and left untried. I think there's a lot of truth to that statement. And the reason why some people never come to faith in Jesus Christ and you know, the attendant blessings that go along with that is because they refuse to think. They refuse to dig deep. They refuse to open their heart and say, entertain the possibility that there might be a God, and if there was, who is He? Or these scriptures, let's just pretend that they are inspired by God and let me see what outcome comes from that. And if they would be honest, and if we would be honest, then we will find that the truth welcomes and rewards honest investigation. And what our neighbors might find is that, hey, Christianity actually makes a whole lot of sense. This is a, is a good worldview to have. This makes sense, and I can see myself following that. Brethren, we have to facilitate that. We are, we are the people that get others to understand that Christianity makes sense. And we can reach them when we present the gospel with reason, with logic, and with the scriptures. That's, that's what Paul did, and that's why you're open to Acts chapter 17. That's the approach of Paul. It didn't matter where Paul was. Whether he was out in the marketplace talking to regular people, picking up their groceries, whether he was in the academy with the intellectual elite, or, or whether he was in the synagogue with the Pharisees and the scribes, his approach was always the same. Acts chapter 17 and verse 2, according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths, what did he do? Reasoned with them from the scriptures. Skip ahead to verse 17. Now he's in Athens. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. He's reasoning with them. Skip ahead to chapter 18 in verse 4. He was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Skip ahead to verse 19 of chapter 18. They came to Ephesus now, and he left them there. Now himself entered the synagogue, and he reasoned with the Jews. Chapter 19, in verse 8, and he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. We could go on and on and on, but you get the point. You see what Paul was doing? Using logic, deduction, reason, using persuasive speech to get people to see Jesus is the Christ and you need Him. You need Him for life, for salvation. And it makes a whole lot of sense. And it made sense to some people, not to all people, but it made sense to some people. And so that's our job. So I want to give you uh, three things, three things today about uh, reaching the skeptic. And I want to suggest to you, Christianity makes sense, number one, when we understand the faith it takes to doubt it. Number two, if you're taking notes, the problems we have without it. And number three, the beauty we see within it. So number one, Christianity makes sense when we see the faith it takes to doubt it. People embrace the gospel message when it gets harder and harder to justify not believing in it. Right? That's what happened to me. I was just going every Sunday listening to Bob teach, and I just beating me down. Oh, there goes that doubt. There goes that doubt. So all, all of our doubts are becoming weaker and weaker, and the case for Christ becomes stronger and stronger. That's your job. Now, you, you won't do that on Facebook with a comment. You won't do that by sitting down with somebody for five minutes. But, you know, you might do that through, through weeks of teaching and through exposure at the workplace. Or through maybe even years of, of, of friendship and, 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 and talking with people. That's, that's our job, is to 
uh, respectfully answer objections to Christianity. Number one, with our example and our behavior, with our lives to make sure our lives are matching the truth. And number two, by opening our mouths and defending the truth. Isn't that what Jude would tell the people he was writing to in Jude in verse 3? He says, he says for them to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. That's the job of the Christian. Or what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3 in verse 15 and 16. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, being always ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you, yet with gentleness and respect. And he would go on to say in verse 16 that your behavior needs to match your teaching. So that these people who are slandering you would be put to shame when they see your good deeds in Christ. Or as James says in James chapter 3, in verse 13, James says, Is any among you wise? Does anyone have understanding? And he says there, if I can just get to it, verse 13, Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. That's what we're called to do. Live the truth and speak the truth. Do so with reason and do so with persuasion. I'll give you three examples of some doubts that we can, we can destroy with the gospel. We can destroy with the gospel. First of all, have you ever heard someone say, well, there can't just be one true way to heaven. There can't just be one way to get to heaven. It's too limiting. It's too narrow-minded to think that there's only one way to connect to God and, and, and you know, get to eternal bliss or, or whatever it is, whatever your version of heaven is. And you've heard the mountain metaphor. Here we all are as a human race. We're standing at the, at the feet of this, the, the foot of this mountain and we all want to get to the top and I've got my way to get to the top and you've got your way to get to the top, right? And so we're all going different ways. You might choose Hinduism. I might choose Christianity. You might choose, you know, the Islamic faith. But we're all really going to the same, to the same way. Uh, the words of uh, Shmuley Botiak, the, the rabbi, the outspoken rabbi, he says... I am absolutely against any religion that says that one faith is superior to another. I don't see how that is anything different than spiritual racism. It's a way of saying that we are closer to God than you, and that is what leads to hatred. That's kind of an ironic thing to say, but um, in, in, again, we're, we're, we're in an age of skepticism, but we're also in an age of, of tolerance. We've talked about that. And people are so tolerant that they're intolerant of anyone who doesn't have their views of, of tolerance and who, doesn't, who don't you know, uh, have that same thinking that, that Rabbi Shmuley has uh, here. Um, but first of all, there's a number of things wrong with this statement, but he's making an absolute statement against absolutes, and that's defeat, self-defeating. Uh, but second of all, how could anyone know that? How could anyone know... Think about it. How can anyone know that there's only one way to get to the top of the mountain? The only possible way that you could know that there's only one, that, 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 there's, that there's many ways to get to the top of this mountain and not just one way is if you were sitting at the top of the mountain. And of course, that seat is already occupied by, by God, right? You would have to have this ultimate perspective. You would have to have this perfect knowledge of truth that you just said nobody's allowed to have. And so philosophically, this is impossible to justify. It doesn't hold water. It doesn't stand on its own. And then you come to the Bible, which was read for us just a moment ago, John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus did make absolute truth claims, didn't he? He certainly did. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, uh, through me. So he did make, he did say that there's one way to get to the top, top of the mountain, and, and it's me. But he did so after having fully established his own credibility, right, with, with miracles. In fact, if you remember in John chapter 10, if you want to flip over there, Jesus actually invites this kind of thinking, invites this kind of investigation, he says, look at me in, in chapter 10 and verse 37. If I do not do the works of my Father, then don't believe me. Look at my life. Look at the miracles I'm doing. If you don't see me as, as, as come from heaven, as one with the Father, then I'm not asking you to believe me. But he says in verse 38, but if I do them, 
Though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know that I, and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. So Jesus makes an absolute truth claim, but he backs it up with his life and with his teaching and with his miracles. What about this one? How could a loving, omnipotent God allow suffering and evil? This perhaps is one of the strongest arguments, I think. How could a loving and omnipotent God exist while there's all this human evil and all this suffering and all this, and all this death? Epicurus, uh, if, if you remember, actually, in Acts chapter 17, remember the Stoics and the Epicureans? The Epicureans, they followed this guy who said this a couple hundred years before Paul came to Athens. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? That sounds really convincing, and it sounds really smart. You'd be an idiot to say otherwise, right? But again, think about the, stru the structure of Epicurus's argument. It's really, it's not an argument, it's an assertion. Think, think about the structure of what he's saying and how, how absolutely arrogant it is. Again, he is putting himself at the top of the mountain here. He, Im he implies one making, making this claim would have to possess universal knowledge, would have to know everything in order for this to be true. And that, that if you go back to Job in chapter 38, I think this is, this is partially the message of Job. N nearing the end there, what's going on with Job? Well, he's dealing with human suffering. He's dealing with death and of his family. He's dealing with the, the pain of the sores in his body, the loss of all of his livestock. Here's a guy who is receiving the, the calamity of being a human being just all at once, and he's trying to work this out. And he's dealing with it. His three friends come, and they bring their philosophy of the day. And, but even Job himself is questioning, why, God? Why? Why? Why is all this happening to me? And then all of a sudden in chapter 38, God comes out of the whirlwind. And he breaks the silence of, of human wisdom and human reasoning. And, and basically, you know what God's answer was? You're not me, buddy. Sit down. That's his answer. <laughs> You're not the creator. He says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge in verse 2? Job, gird up the loins like a man. And I will ask you and you instruct, were you there when I created the earth? Were you there when I created the Leviathan? Were you there when I created Behemoth? What is God trying to tell Job? He's trying to put Job in his place. You're not me, Job. If we make this assertion, how could a loving, omnipotent God allow suffering and evil? You know what we're really saying? A loving, omnipotent God can't exist with the reality of human suffering and evil because I can't think of a good reason for him to exist. I can't think of a good reason for this suffering and evil. But could it be that if there was a God who created the universe, then perhaps, maybe, 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 if he's powerful enough to create the universe, he's wise enough to, to, to make this world flourish and hold the planets together and all of that, perhaps could there be a reason you and I haven't thought of for human suffering and evil? We need to be put in our place. And, and, and not make these arrogant assumptions. Assuming something can exist because we can't think of a good reason, that is a doubt that is on very, very shaky ground and it's simply not justifiable. And by the way, recognizing the reality of evil is actually not an argument against the existence of God. It's actually an argument for the existence of God. By recognizing the existence of evil, that implies that we're measuring evil in some way. We have a standard of measurement. And how do we measure that which is evil? Only by that which is good, right? How do you measure darkness? You can't measure darkness. You can only measure the absence of light. And this is what the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, you know, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what did Jesus do? Don't call me good. There is only one who's good. There's only one measuring stick for goodness, and that is God. 
So again, we're on shaky ground when we make this assertion. And our doubts get even weaker when we consider that Jesus, God, who created everything, who holds the planets together, who was the one speaking to Job in Job 38, God became man in the flesh, in the person of Jesus. He even participated in human suffering and evil, was a victim of human suffering and evil to save us from suffering and evil. Philip Yancey said, any discussion of how pain and suffering fit into God's scheme ultimately leads us to the cross. I like what um, John Stott says, before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. So the real reason for human suffering and evil that God allows to go on is because of our human free will, because we have made a mess of things. Number three, have you ever heard someone say, so much evil has been done in the name of Christianity. And based upon that, I'm not going to align myself with Christianity or any other world religion. I'll tell you what, nobody can deny that one. Nobody can deny that one. There have been atrocities committed in the name of Christianity. Ken Shai, an atheist, said this, Christianity has been used throughout history as an excuse for some of the most brutal, heartless, and senseless atrocities known to man. The historical examples are not difficult to recall. The Crusades, the Inquisitions, the, the Salem witch trials, the witch burnings, the Holocaust. I did not see much in Christianity that I considered to be worth having. Again, that sounds pretty smart, but there's some holes in that. We should, we should acknowledge that, that it is true that many people have used Christianity uh, to commit human evil. We should acknowledge that, but we need to acknowledge it with a proper perspective. Just like um, Paul said in Romans chapter 9 in verse 6, not all are Israel who are descended from Israel, right? Not everyone is, is a true Israelite just because they have the blood of Abraham and because they've been circumcised. And likewise, not all that calls itself Christian is Christian. If we read the teachings of Jesus, again, if we would just open our Bibles, again, we would see the heart of Christianity. We would see that Jesus never advocated violence, especially advocating violence to spread his kingdom, just the opposite. He told Peter, as Peter took out his sword to defend him in the garden, to put that sword away. He told us and He taught us how to treat our enemies. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I'm telling you, you need to love your enemy. You need to love him. If he's hungry, give him something to eat. If, you, if your enemy hates you, guess what? You should pray for those who despitefully use you. You should be loving him so that he can understand what love is and he can be transformed himself. And again, when Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my disciples would be fighting for me. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world, John 18, 36. And so this, this last doubt here is really thrown out. The issue is not with Christianity itself. Christianity is pure and good. It's with hypocrisy. It's with hypocritical Christians. Even the word hypocrisy implies that the behavior is not representative of reality. So the people who were, you know, crusading and, and, and killing Muslims to defend the Holy Land, they were not doing so out of any Christian motive whatsoever. Jesus never told them to do that, and so that's not a good representation of Christianity at all. But, so if we're arguing then against hypocrisy, is hypocrisy a good reason to deny Christianity? I like what Darrell Whitmer says. Kind of funny. Since when do you allow hypocrisy to determine your affiliation and participation? We've all heard of medical quacks, but have you stopped going to the doctor? Maybe not that one, but... There have been news reports of hamburgers contaminated with E. coli, but have you stopped eating Big Macs? Jonathan Pollard and Benedict Arnold were phony, hypocritical Americans, but are you planning to leave the country, and where would you go anyway? With what faith would you align yourself? Certainly, there are also hypocritical Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists, even atheists. And so it's unfair. It's unfair to judge Christianity on the merits of those who were not true Christians. 
It's also unfair for the sake of the hip, hip, hypocritical Christians to throw out all of the genuine good that true Christians have brought to this world. All of us have been recipients of mercy and grace upon grace and a giving spirit of, of the true believers in God. Kennedy said, Christianity has been a boon to mankind and has had a beneficent effect upon the human race. Most people today who live in, a, in an ostensibly Christian environment with Christian ethics do not realize how much we owe Jesus. What goodness and mercy there is in this world has come in large measure from Him. I think we miss that because we live in America. This country was founded uh, on you know, Christian principles. Uh, and, and again, we're, we're uh, imperfect people, surely. But the reason why we're so charitable, uh, such a, we give more money than any other country in this world to other countries. The reason why we're so charitable, the reason why we have all these organizations, these, these, these social groups to help people in need, why do you think that is? We owe that to Jesus. We owe that at least to the influence that Jesus has had on the people, on the leaders of, the, of this country. And so every doubt of the Christian faith is based on an even more incredible doubt on a weak assumption, and not on evidence. So we talked about the faith it takes to doubt it. Well, Christianity also makes sense when we understand the problems we have without it. If we choose to deny God or we choose to, to not follow the Lord, then we're going to be living a life without any hope. And the believer, on the other hand, has abundant hope, right? He, the hope of the Christian, it's what shapes his life and what shapes all of his decision-making. But you take God out of the picture, you erase God, and that will erase all of your hope. And that's how the non-biblical, the secular mind, thinks about things. They, they believe that there is no life after death. It's only the, the ultimate end of personal existence. It's the snuffing out of the conscience. It is nothing. Do you know what... Uh, Greatest definition. Aristotle defined nothing, that which rocks dream about. That, that sums it up, right? That's what, that's what people think is going to happen after you die. Just nothing. Just the end of all existence. Bertrand Russell, this brilliant mathematician and logician, and he was also a very outspoken atheist, he said uh, of the end, was going to be a random collocation of atoms, mindless without destiny. Ultimately, the collapse of the universe will bring all of our hopes crashing to disaster and pessimism. Boy, I'd like to have lunch with that guy, a little ball of sunshine, you know. I... <laughs> do, you, do you think maybe that, that attitude would affect the way this man lived? Who would want to be around? You, you want to jump off a building after hanging around this guy after a while. <laughs> it's not a cheerful way to go through life. But the ultimate hope of the Christian is the opposite of that. The ultimate hope of the Christian is not here and now. It lies beyond the grave. And it makes living so much more tolerable. It even makes living joyful. Then you've got, you've got Bertrand Russell over here. You've got the Apostle Paul. And he's in a Roman prison. And, and he's on death row, right? And he's uh, awaiting his verdict. Am I going to die? Am I going to live? Are they going to chop off my head? Or are they going to let me go? And he writes one of the most joyful letters you have in your Bible, the, the, the letter of, to the Philippians. And, and he says to those people, Hmm, as he's contemplating his verdict, he doesn't know what's going to happen. I might, I might die, I might live. And he says, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. In other words, to, to live would be a great blessing because I can continue to work with you, I can continue to convert people to Jesus, but to die, whew, that's where it's at. I'll be, I'll be that much closer to my Lord. I'll be with Him. And that's what I'm aiming for. Because my citizenship, as he would say in Philippians 3.20, is not on earth. My, our citizenship is in heaven from which we await a Savior. The redemption of our bodies through the resurrection of Christ. That's what Paul was looking forward to. That's what you and I are looking forward to. Which perspective would you rather have? Would you like to have your hopes crashing to disaster and pessimism? Or to live is Christ, and to die is gain. A life without hope. Second of all, a life without meaning. If I say there is no God, if I say, if I choose not to follow the Lord and, and, and renounce the teachings of the Bible, then what, what do I do with these questions about my purpose and my existence? Why am I here? What purpose can I possibly have? If you don't have a Christian view, then whatever meaning, whatever purpose that you fabricate for yourself 
whether you find your purpose in your family or your job or your hobbies or your friends, it's not going to be able to withstand the sufferings and the trials of this life. It will crumble, and you will crumble with it. Secular culture, non-Bible non thinkers, they, they say we find meaning here and now. And if I find my meaning, my truest meaning, who I am here and now, then suffering and death will take away my purpose, will take away my meaning. It will destroy my, the purpose of my existence. But because our purpose as Christians lies beyond this physical world, suffering has the opposite effect. Suffering actually reminds us that this world is not our home. Suffering actually serves to strengthen our convictions, to strengthen our resolve, to keep going and to keep doing the right thing. As Paul said in the book of Romans in chapter 8, the book of Romans in chapter 8 in verse uh, 18. He said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Because he had that eternal perspective, he was looking toward the glory, the suffering had less of an effect on his life. And likewise, as he says to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 in verse 16, we don't lose heart. We don't give up because this outer man, this body is decaying because the inner man, the spirit, the soul of a human being, it's being renewed day by day. And so he's able to look at, at being shipwrecked and being whipped in the back 39 times and being stoned and left for dead and being outside in hunger and living in a tent and, and not having any money. He's able to look at all those things and he, he calls them momentary light affliction. <laughs> How? Because he had this eternal perspective. It's producing for us, this, all the pain of this life is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. And so if we don't find perspective, uh, if we don't have this, this Christian perspective then, what's going to happen when tragedy hits? If you find your meaning, if you find your purpose in, in your job, what's going to happen when you lose your job? If you find your true purpose in your spouse... What's going to happen when, when she gets ill? If you find your true purpose in your hobbies or your friendships, all of those things are going to be taken away. But there's one thing that can't be taken away, and that's your relationship with God. And that's what we have to be teaching people about. If you don't have that, you're trapped in the parable of Sisyphus. You remember the Greek god Sisyphus? He's doomed to take this big boulder and he rolls it up to the top of the hill and it rolls back down again. And he does that for all eternity. Meaningless, repetitive existence. And then it ends. I'd rather have the perspective of Paul, have meaning, have hope. A life without justice also. A life without justice. The secular view, it has no answer for the inherent desire within man for justice. Why do we have that desire? Why does it doesn't matter who you are, what culture you live in, if someone steals your car, you're going to be angry with it? Why? What? Why does every human being have that? Well, of course, our answer is God wired us that way. But in this life, we don't find justice. We certainly don't find it in our personal lives. Sometimes it slips through the cracks of our, of our court system. And so if you have a secular worldview, and this is it, in the end, there's nothing, then there's essentially there's no difference between Hitler and someone like Bill McCubbin, who's given his whole life to Jesus. Right? What's the point of even loving your neighbor? What's the point of doing anything kind at all if in the end it doesn't matter? The Apostle Paul says we will all come to the judgment seat of Christ to receive that which is due to us in the flesh, whether we've done good or we've done evil. We're all going to have to give an account for God. And that leads to a life without morality. If you take God out of the picture, you have no fixed moral reference point at all. If you, if you do not believe in God, you do not believe in the Bible, and you choose not to follow Jesus, then what gives you the right to make any moral pronouncement on your neighbor whatsoever? What gives you the right to say, I'm wrong and you're right? You have no reference point. Or that you should stop doing that and start doing that. Any ethical judgment is purely a product of your own imagination or your own culture. And so it, it, it depends on the time. It depends on the society in which you live. What's right and wrong is moral or, or, or it's relative to the situation. 
And so you can't impose your judgment upon anyone else. There's no one standard of judgment that all people are accountable to. And if you live, if you want to see a society in which there is no one standard of right and wrong, of good and evil for all people, if you want to see a society like that, read the book of Judges and you'll see it. It's corrupt from the inside out. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. Classic example of this is after the Holocaust, okay? So everyone, the whole world finds out what went on, that these Nazis were exterminating, trying to exterminate the Jewish race. Six million people, over six million people die at the hands of the Germans. And so during the Nuremberg trials, when these, when these men were brought before the world stage to answer for their crimes, there was an interesting question going around. How are these lawyers going to defend this, right? How are they going to defend what they did to all these people? And you know what their answer was? We were only operating under the laws of our land. That's judges. We were just doing what we thought was right. There's the postmodern perspective back in the 40s. There's Friedrich Nietzsche's writing, all that nonsense. There, there's it played out in detail and in real life. And finally, one guy, just frustrated, he stood up and he, and he said during the trial, but is there not a law above our law? Here we go, right? There's your in when you're talking to somebody. There is a law that's transcendent of our conscience, of our culture, and it's the eternal word of God. Finally, Christianity makes sense when we understand the beauty that we see within it. There's a unique beauty to Christianity. It answers all of life's most important questions. John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So you have three essential aspects of our existence that are answered there. For which secular thinking and, and atheistic principles have no answer to. You have the way to live is Jesus. You have the, the foundation for all decision-making. You have the moral compass. It's the truth. And you have the living hope for tomorrow. It's eternal life through the resurrection of Jesus. And if you just look at the story of the Bible itself, it's just a beautiful story. God creates mankind to share in His love. Mankind turns their back on God. God through the ages is reaching out to mankind. He comes down Himself in the form of Jesus and He shows us how much He loves us by going through the pain and the agony of, of, of the cross. And then He was raised to walk in newness of life and to, to go back to the Father and to reign, to give us the hope of eternal life. There's, if you look at how Jesus spoke to people, the miracles He did, His teachings, His resurrection, there's no way to account for the beauty of Jesus unless... He is who He says He is, the Son of God. Please close your Bibles and open your songbooks to the song that Bill has selected for us. Song number 329. God is calling us this morning. Are you skeptical? I hope that, that through... Some of the things we've discussed, I hope that we've erased and, and we've weakened some of those doubts and those, those uh, skeptical um, views that you had. If you still are skeptical, let's talk after service. But in Jesus, you, you, you have a fixed morality, you have a compass, you have a purpose for your life, you have hope for the future. You have this great promise of the resurrection and it can help you deal with the problems of the present. Because you know something better. The best is yet to come. And that's what God is calling you to. To, to participate in life. And to receive the, the good gifts that He so desperately wants to give you. And so if you're skeptical, but now you see the truth and you'd like to become a Christian, we ask that you would repent and believe the gospel and show that you do by having your sins forgiven in baptism as we stand and sing right now.